School choice is a priority for Florida's new House Speaker Paul Renner. And House Speaker Paul Renner is with us this morning live. And it is so good to have you, Speaker. Great to have you on the program. Great to be with you, Glenna. And thank you for sparing some of your Sunday with us. I know that's not always so easy, but let me start with this uh, HB1. You gave it the number one bill in the House this week. Is it fair to say that this really does dismantle and rebuild the structure of school in Florida? Well, it's really an extension of what Florida has been undertaking for 25 years, which is just saying that students should go to the school that best fits their needs. And, and whatever that is, wherever that is, we have many great public schools. Uh, I was a public school student throughout my entire tenure, but some, some children uh, don't succeed in the environment where their zip code tells them they should go. And so we should have other alternatives, whether that's charter schools or home schools or private schools. And so this bill is really an extension of what we've begun so that every child gets the education that best fits their individual needs. So I want to really let our viewers hear some of the details in the plan because uh, the devil is always in the details. But I want to pick up on what you just said 25 years ago um, and shout out to Miami guy, Jeb Bush, former governor who actually started the voucher program. Um, what is in this bill sort of not only continues and builds upon that, but but builds it very differently because the voucher program typically would be for either lower income families to give them the financial wherewithal to go to a private school, send their children to private school, or uh, people with special needs, um, I guess they call it special abilities now, who, who need a different kind of schooling. And those were the kind of guardrails on the vouchers and you had to be eligible for that. And this blows that all up. There, there is no need-based eligibility requirements now, right? Right? This is for everybody. Well, the two things I'm most excited about in this bill, and you mentioned uh, ch children with unique abilities. So think of children with autism or Down syndrome. Right now, uh, given the uh, current structure of our program, there's a wait list and, and estimates vary, but somewhere around 9,000 students who have unique abilities who are being told no. And what a terrible thing for a parent to have to be shut out of that. And so this bill, when you said blows the doors off, it, it, it lifts that wait list so that we will never again tell an autism child or a child with other unique abilities that they can't get the specialized education that they need. And I'm super excited about that aspect of the bill. But the other part of it is what's called an ESA, an educational savings account. So currently in our program, for those that do not have unique abilities, you can only pay for tuition, but you can't customize that any further. We want to be able to say that, look, if you need to have a uh, in-home tutor, which could be a public school teacher that comes in your home to help your child with math or reading, you can use this account in more customizable ways. And I think that will empower both parents and students, as well as their teachers and school advisors to make sure that every child gets a customized education. And so that ESA component is new. Now it's already there in place for the unique ability students, but it's not for the other students who enjoy this program. Okay. And so I should say, you know, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I want to, the ESA component, could you sort of compare that to uh, a health savings account or a, a flex medical account where, where you get this pot of money to spend on, on certain things pertaining to education? W would that be a fair comparison? Uh I think that's a great comparison. What we've done that's a little bit different some of some of the other states who have allowed it for uniforms and things that have an educational that are related to education. We've restricted it to things that are purely uh, directly related to education. So if you need to pay for an online course or, or again, a home, a home in home tutor, that type of thing would now be uh, allowed under this new bill if it's passed. So there are questions, oh, so many questions, on, on capacity and are there enough private schools? And, but really the essential question is, because you, you know, you, you've seen the blowback, you've seen the concern, you've seen the fear of, about the demise of public education and public schools. So, Mr. Speaker, what, with all of this choice, and we'll go into more of the detail, but with all of this choice, who do you expect, which families, what kind of families would you expect would choose to remain in their neighborhoods' public schools. Do you, do you see that happening? 
Well, absolutely, it's happening today. So our current cap is over $100,000 for a family of four, but the majority of students that use our program, make the, their families make less than $40,000 a year, and 75% come from minority communities. So there are many, many people that are very happy with their public schools. As I mentioned, I, I went through K through 12. I think I turned out okay. My mom was a public school teacher. There's many great public schools. It's gonna be a good year for public schools in the legislature legislature on some other bills we'll be working on and things we'll be funding. So many people will stay just where they are as they are today with that um, pretty elevated cap. And so I think uh, those concerns are really overwrought. We've spent more money uh, devoted to all forms of public education in the time that I've been in the legislature. And I expect that to continue again this year. Would you say that this might be a spur to make public schools and the administrators of those public schools um, feel like they need to be a bit more competitive to to win that choice? That's exactly right. And the power of choice is just that. You know, imagine uh, that you're told that you're going to go out and shop for a car, but you can only shop on the car lot that's nearest to your home, the one your, your zip code tells you you can attend. And if you don't like and say that's a Ford uh, dealership and you don't like what you see there, you can't leave. You can't go to Chevy or GMC or, or, any, or Toyota. You can't go anywhere. You're stuck there. That's the system that we inherited with a monopoly. And that just doesn't lead to good results. And so choice over the last 25 years, and you mentioned the transformational path that Governor Jeb Bush put us on 25 years ago, has made our public schools better. We went from being at the bottom of the barrel to third in the nation in our public schools. I'm proud of our public schools and we wanna make sure we give them every resource to succeed. But you're absolutely right, Glenna, that this choice program, and this will just build on that, will make everyone better. Because if you don't like it, you have not only an entrance, but you also have an exit to leave that school if they don't meet your child's needs. And I think that's the power of what we're about to do. So I want to, part of um, the Bush plan uh, for the past 25 years was built in accountability measures. And I want to talk to you a little bit about accountability and what's there and the financial component of all this. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Talking about the priority bill filed this week, HB1, which is going to be a vast expansion of the school voucher program. Universal choice is what people in Tallahassee are calling it right now. Mr. Speaker, I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of the guide rails and guidelines for this universal choice where families could choose public school or private school or even homeschool, parochial schools. There doesn't seem to be really a limit on who does this education. So I wonder if you would frame for us the accountability measures. Um, you know, we like to think that everybody acts on good faith and we in this business in particular know that's not always the case. So what are the, are the guardrails in place for the spending of money, where it goes, who uses it, and, and that it's being spent well? Well, um, there's two major uh, components to accountability. One is regulatory. And so we, we uh, for example, require standardized testing for those that receive these scholarships and, and the like to make sure that they're progressing and succeeding in their educational pursuits. But there's also market accountability. You know, the students, as I said, many people are very happy with where they are. That's why you haven't already seen a mass exodus in the programs that we've expanded over the years. But um, you know, parents will will look and if they go up to a place, whether it's a charter school or a private school or a virtual school, and they decide that they're not happy, they have the chance to go to yet another place to make sure that they get the best uh, education for their children. So there's both regulatory accountability, but also market accountability. And I think it's important to know that we're not operating or speculating in a vacuum here. We've had this program in increasing uh, scope over the last 25 years and it's working well. What we see in people that participate in the program is that they're more likely to go to high school, more likely to attend college and graduate from college than those like peers that stayed in the traditional public schools. And so I think that's the best indication is does it work or not? And we're all about educational outcomes and rewarding those uh, schools that do well and not rewarding those schools that do not do well. And that really is driven a lot by great parents and students uh, choosing what's right, right for them. Well, no doubt we know just from covering education for so long that parental involvement is, if not the key indicator, then right up there is one of the key indicators of student success. That 
people tell us in education, that across the board. Mr. Speaker, the, um, so this family empowerment voucher that now everybody is available for, no need-based anymore, um, do you expect that there are families maybe who do send their children to private school now, um, and some of the private schools are not as expensive as others, some are very expensive, including someone's annual salary as tuition every year. But but do you how do you see that going now that there's not a need base, there's still really not so much of a level playing field when tuitions vary from school to school so much. Um, you know, people or families with more resources will still be able to make choices that others could not. Is is that valid? Yeah, and I think it's important to note that our bill prioritizes low-income families. It prioritizes families with unique abilities. And it's really there that you see, as I mentioned, the majority of students on the program today, even though we have a cap that's over $100,000 today before this bill, the majority of students that participate, uh, their families make less than $40,000 a year. And and so um, it, it's, it is the case that in um, upper income neighborhoods, you tend to have public schools that perform better. And so this is really, in my mind, about the civil rights uh, moment of our generation and making sure that we're taking care of every single child. No child should be trapped in their zip code. And, and as I said, what you're seeing in practice, we don't have to speculate, is that the majority of students that have and will take advantage of this program are in schools that may be lower income neighborhoods that are just not meeting their needs. We should be able to give that child the same God-given right to excel as a child that, that makes, uh, whose family makes a lot of money. And I'm super excited about making sure we continue down that path, especially for our children with unique abilities. The bill that's filed, it was filed um, Thursday, Wednesday night or Thursday, uh, pretty comprehensive. And some people who like to do things firsthand can go on the House website right now and, and read through it. Um, what I love is the little, what I call the cheat sheets that the House provides in the bill analysis. And that was pretty thorough, and there's something that stuck out in the bill analysis that I wanted to talk to you about, and that was, this is a quote, indeterminate fiscal analysis, unquote. So that means, what about the money? We don't know right now. Does that concern you? No, this is normal. I mean, it's number for all the bills that we have that have a fiscal component. You have to, in some respect, make an estimate of how many people will take up the new opportunities that are there. And I said on the front of unique students with unique abilities, we have uh, estimates that, that range um, depending on who you're talking to. But in general, we're talking about somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000 students um, that, that currently have been blocked from participating. And so there's a number you can actually attach to that. What we don't know is with the change in income caps, how many parents will take advantage of that. We know that with income caps currently over $100,000, that the vast majority of students are still coming from these lower income uh, communities. Uh, and so I would expect that to continue, but that's where we, the smart you know, economic people get together and give us a, an estimate, a fiscal estimate, which we need, because unlike the federal government, we have a balanced budget, we do balance our budget, and we wanna make sure we come in uh, with the, the amount of money we're gonna devote to this, again, prioritizing children who are lower income, children who have unique abilities to make sure they're first in line. So how would, you're talking to a lot of families who are gonna be really interested in exploring the possibilities, where do they start? How, how do you know where to go, what to do, what your options are? Well, there's resources out there. Our Step Up for Students program, which has been managing the hundreds of thousands of children who already participate in these choice programs, have a lot of resources. I would start there. The Department of Education can certainly help. And, uh, and if not, you can call us at the Florida House or, or the Florida Senate. We have just some great staff uh, who know these programs inside and out to help navigate that. And as I say navigate, an interesting and, and uh, exciting part of this bill is to set up choice navigators. And so that will phase in over time so that a parent and a student can sit down with somebody who's an educational person uh, along with their teachers and schools and say, hey, look, here are your, your, uh, your grades, your, your scores. This is what's going on in your life and in your development that only parents know best. 
And here's some recommendations about how we might layer on to your education and further customize it through those ESA programs to make sure we're getting absolutely the best out of your education for, for your child. And even brothers and sisters learn differently. Some are good in math or good in, in our reading. And so this is really about maximizing customization, getting the most out of every single child's potential. And I'm super excited about it. House Speaker Paul Renner, it is really good to have you. I, I, sh I should say this is not a done deal yet. First committee meeting is later this week on Thursday, but uh, so much support in a majority conservative legislature. We have no doubt that this will be law by the end of May. But um, meanwhile, I hope you come back and talk with us about all kinds of things going on in Tallahassee as the year progresses. We sure do appreciate your time. I look forward to it, Glenna. Thank you.